One of the other issues worth talking about, which is also discussed in the book, is the question of hate speech, um, where the United States has a position that is different from many Western democracies. Um, many Western democracies have laws against hate speech um, and attempt to prohibit it. Um, the United States a Supreme Court in 1951, um, at a time when First Amendment protection was relatively thin still in this country, um, held essentially that laws against hate speech were constitutional in the United States. Um, the same time that they were holding that members of the Communist Party could be put in jail um, for espous espousing their views. Um, so it was kind of a low point in First Amendment protection. But in the years since then, the court has, uh, both liberal and conservative justices, have unanimously come to the opposite conclusion and have said that th there cannot be a doctrine that uh, prohibits the, the publication or the espousal of what others might call hate speech. And the reason the court has come to that view is because it has basically embraced a principle that says that government may not restrict speech because of the point of view or the ideas being expressed. That we simply do not trust government to decide for us what are good and bad ideas. And if we, if we give the government the authority to make those judgments, then they will abuse that authority inevitably. And we, the justices, don't want the power to decide which ideas the government should be allowed to suppress and which ideas they shouldn't be allowed to suppress, because we too are vulnerable to our own biases and our own um, uh, uh, ideologies. So the court has basically endorsed as a very strict rule that the government may not restrict speech because the particular point of view being expressed by the individual um, is seen as undesirable or hurtful unless that speech can be shown to create, at the very least, a clear and present danger of grave harm. Um, and that's a standard that the Supreme Court has actually never in the last half century, has never found to be satisfied in any case. Um, it's that demanding a standard. And so with hate speech, the government says, we don't see any principled way to treat hate speech differently from any other speech that other people may hate. And it may be hurtful, but lots of speech is hurtful. It may cause harm. Lots of speech causes harm, like the World War I speech did, in fact, cause harm. Um, but we don't think government should be in the business of picking and choosing what ideas are, are prohibitable. This is one area where American law is very different from that in many other Western democracies. And what, what Americans who defend that position would say is that we have learned from our own mistakes. And that having attempted to have a constitutional guarantee of free speech, and to be rigorous about protecting it, we have learned we can't trust ourselves. And therefore, we have to bend over backwards to tolerate things that the majority of us may think are horrible. Um, European countries haven't had a tradition of free speech in a constitutional sense for very long. Most of them have moved in that direction only relatively recently. They haven't learned yet how they're going to screw up and what dangers they create when they start picking and choosing what speech they can decide is prohibitable. And we'll see what happens with that. I mean, it may be a problem uh, of the sort that, that I just identified. Maybe it'll work out just fine. Um, but in, in this sense, I think there's a very unanimous and rigorous commitment to the principle here, really beginning with the Skokie case involving the Nazis marching in Skokie, uh, where the court has come to the view that we just can't allow uh, the majority to pick and choose what ideas they find uh, don't have value. Um, because for lots of ideas we once thought didn't have value. Abortion should be legal. Gays should have rights. Uh, uh, interracial marriage should be a constitutional right. Those are things which would have been regarded as completely off the charts in the past. And only because we allowed those ideas to be expressed and allowed people to address them and think about them, we changed our minds. And we don't think that the majority or the court should have the authority to decide which ideas are off the table and which are not. Because if we'd done that in the past, we'd be a worse society today than we are. So this is, um, <clears throat> this is uh, really an important subject. Obviously, everybody in this room has been part of discussions, read things. You know, have we taken free speech in America too far? And are we protecting people who are hurting others and undermining the culture of decency in, uh, in the country? 
uh, what Jeff, just to sort of describe Jeff, Jeff is the leading person in the First Amendment um, uh, group of uh, scholars over the past uh, 50 years who has most articulated and refined this uh, idea that we need an analytical framework for thinking about uh, attempts to censor uh, speech. And that framework is if the government is trying to regulate a viewpoint or content of the speech, it's, it's done. We're not going to allow that. But if it's trying to do other things and there's this kind of, it's not a, intending to stop ideas or, okay, that kind of difference is extremely important and has been absolutely the defining kind of framework for First Amendment uh, thinking. Uh, and, and as I said, very complex. And Jeff's articles and books about this are, are brilliant. Um, I take a little bit different view on this and, and um, a little um, uh, sort of, I don't know, airier view, I suppose. It's hard to describe. I think the, the, the thing that has always fascinated me about uh, this phenomena in American jurisprudence of protecting uh, extremist speech or hate speech or so, is um, several things. I mean, as important to note, as Jeff says, the United States stands alone in the world and in human history in the degree to which this kind of speech is protected. So uh, this is uh, an historic choice and an experiment in a way. So every other modern democracy uh, draws that line closer in on ter against uh, extremist speech. And it's sort of hard to say that, um, that, you know, that these other democracies are not democracies because they do. There's something going on here that uh, uh, I think one has to unravel. So for me, uh, I start with the idea that the First Amendment has been more than just a line-setting operation for when the government can regulate in speech or not. It is such a powerful set of cases and ideas and theories and so on that it has become part of the American identity. If you ask Americans, what does it mean to be American? One of the things that will be said right away is we believe in freedom of speech and press and openness. And people have different views about this. And it's an astonishing thing uh, to sort of see how an idea can seep in and define a culture. You ask Europeans, what does it mean to be French and what does it mean to be? They don't go right away to freedom of speech and press, but for us, openness and so on. And part of that plays out in the context of protecting really nasty, bad speech. There's some kind of almost pride in us as a society being able to tolerate that. The judges always say, this is horrible speech. We totally disagree and condemn this content. Quite unique, actually, because judges you know, shouldn't be sort of commenting on this, but they do in the hate speech. That's why when Trump said, there are good people on both sides of that, that was a public official changing the dynamics of what is happening in protection of speech. Because the, in order for us to protect extremist hate speech, we have to all agree, basically. That's horrible. But then there's something in, we're, we're a society that believes that we have problems in accepting ideas. And in this realm of freedom of speech, we're going to, as Jeff said, bend over backwards to allow even the worst people, the worst ideas, Nazism, Holocaust, etc. We're going to accept uh, their right to speak because we are confident that we can counter this and so on. Other societies um, don't. In Germany, you cannot publish Mein Kampf. You cannot promote Nazism. And you understand why German society would go that route and why America might take a different 